David Friedman, in your book, Hidden Order, The Economics of Everyday Life, you have two economic jokes. And I'm going to read the first one and ask you what it means. On page 17, economic joke number one, two economists walked past a Porsche showroom. One of them pointed at a shiny car in the window and said, I want that. Obviously not, the other replied. If he had wanted it, he wouldn't have been walking past the showroom. He would have been walking into the showroom. The point of that joke is that the way we measure values is by actions. And that if I say I really want something and I don't act to get it, that's evidence that it isn't true. That's the, the point of the joke. What's the hardest thing of, about teaching economics? Probably the fact that people think they already know it. That economics deals with the world we're all familiar with. It uses words like efficiency or competition that we think we already understand. And the result is that people miss the fact that there's actually a reasonably rigorous logical argument there. They see it as just talk about familiar things. They think they already understand the answer. Uh, and then when they take the midterm in a course, they suddenly discover that they got 20% when they thought they understood everything except the fine points. What is efficiency? Uh, I spend a chapter trying to answer that question. Uh, an efficient outcome is an outcome that can't be improved. And roughly speaking, an improvement is a change that produces net benefits. So you have to imagine that you change something about the system and you can somehow evaluate how much that the effect of that change is worth to each person affected. You say, well, I'm worse off by a certain amount. You're better off by a certain amount. If you could add all of those up and you say the sum is positive, then you would say that's an improvement. And an outcome is efficient if no further improvement is possible. That's a very short answer to a very complicated question. What's competition? A competitive market uh, is one in which there are many firms, uh, but not necessarily one in which each firm, like a runner in a race, sees the other firms as opponents. If you think about competition and the way people often speak of it in common language, you would say that there's really more competition in a race with four people in it than in a marathon with a thousand people in it, in that each of those four people sees the other three, so to speak, as his enemies, as his rivals. Uh, but the economists would be the other way around. We would say a perfectly competitive market is one with an infinite number of firms, each of which doesn't care about the other firms because each of them knows that each of the other ones is a tiny player, whereas a market with only two or three firms is not very competitive. Economic <laughs> joke number two. So, oh, here it is on page 300. By the way, how come only two? Uh, I need some more. The problem is that what I mean by an economic joke is not a joke about economics, but a joke that teaches economics, a joke that teaches some economic principle. And I thought that I had at least three in that book, so you may have missed one, maybe four. But my collection of economic jokes is quite small. There's at least one that isn't in that book that I got out of the Middle Eastern cookbook that I'm fond of, but I think there are at least three in that book. But tell me what number uh, two is. I, well, I'll, I'll see if I can find it because I'm near the end of the book. Uh, two men encountered a hungry bear. One turned to run. It's hopeless, the other told him. You can't outrun a bear. No, he replied, but I might be able to outrun you. Yes, that joke, uh, the point of that joke is that in most conflicts, the objective is not to make what the other guy is doing impossible, but to make it unprofitable. That is, we tend to think about wars or crime or almost any human conflict as if it was something like a chess game where all I care about is beating you and all you care about is beating me. But that's not the way the real world really is. That if you're a mugger and I'm a victim, your objective isn't to hurt me. Your objective is to make money without working too hard. Uh, if I can set up a situation so that mugging me costs more than it's worth, even though you still can, you won't. All right. Similarly, in that story, chasing me is worth more than it's worth for the bear if he can catch you more easily, uh, which is the point of that one. Do you use a lot of these kinds of economic jokes in your classroom? Well, I don't have a lot of them, unfortunately. They're pretty scarce. Uh, shall I tell you the one you've missed? I found it. Ah, yeah, it's rich. I, did. I missed this near the end. Yes. And it's a longer one. Is the reason yes. I've forgotten it. It's, uh, go ahead. Oh, sure. Uh, it's a joke 
the joke goes as follows. Uh, Jose robbed a bank and fled south across the Rio Grande with the Texas Rangers in hot pursuit. Uh, they caught him in a small town in Mexico, only to discover that Jose spoke no English and none of them spoke any Spanish. So they persuaded one of the locals who knew both languages to act as translator. The Rangers say to the translator, ask Jose where he has hidden the money. The gringos want to know where you have hidden the money. Tell them I will never tell them. Jose says he will never tell you. The rangers pull out their six guns, cock them, point them at Jose's head, and say to the translator, uh, tell Jose that if he does not tell us, we will kill him. The gringos say, if you do not tell them, they will kill you. Jose starts to shake with fear. I, I hit the, the money uh, by the bridge over the river. Jose says he is not afraid to die. The point. The point. That's the problem that economists call incentive compatibility, that in order for a system to work, it has to be in people's interest to act in the way necessary for the system to work. And in this case, it was not in the interest of the translator to tell the truth about what Jose was saying, because, of course, by lying, by pretending that Jose hasn't said where the treasure is, now he hopes the rangers will kill Jose and he will then dig up the treasure. So that. Let me give them a much, perhaps an example of more immediate relevance. Uh, the standard description of how our political system works, how democracy works, assumes that individual voters spend a lot of time and trouble figuring out which candidates are good, which programs are good, what policies the government should follow, and then they vote for the candidates who are in favor of the policies that will make, produce good results, that will make the country prosper. That's sort of an implicit assumption if you think of sort of the high school civics class description of democracy. But then you think a bit about it and you say, well, why should I go to all that trouble? I know that as a single voter, my chance of determining the outcome of the election is very close to zero, probably about one in 10 million, roughly. It isn't worth my spending a lot of time and effort investigating the issues in exchange for one chance in 10 million of affecting the outcome. Given that that's the case, most people won't. Uh, and the result is a system where the average voter can't name his congressman, even though the way we usually describe democracy assumes that he not only knows his congressman, but every vote he's made over the last two years. So that's a respect in which our political system is not incentive compatible. And that's one of the reasons it doesn't work very well. It doesn't tell you if there's any better way, but it does tell you that there's a, a serious problem in getting uh, government to do the things you would like it to do.